Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Dan Brown, the director of the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. We're here for our regular weekly CEPH seminar. Welcome to all of you attending. Um, I'm pretty excited about this one um, because it, uh, it, it, it's sort of an inspired um, presentation inspired by my uh, um, good fortune in having seen an earlier version of this conversation. And I, I was struck by a couple of things, one being the uh, seeming or the feel of intimacy in the conversation, which uh, I was sort of getting tired of the remoteness. I think we've all kind of started to develop and, and adapt to this online world, but uh, this was the first one that really just felt like um, we were kind of getting to know people through the conversation. Um, but it also um, is in line with our uh, interest in the school in developing an inclusive culture and um, um, that certainly inspired a lot of thinking about um, the work that we're doing this year through our DEI committee and um, uh, conversations in, frankly, all of our committees. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, Lisa and Melissa have agreed to sort of redo their conversation. And I'm, I'm grateful also personally for the opportunity to sort of engage in, in it briefly here in the introduction and just um, share my own experience uh, is a, kind of about uh, STEM culture and what it's like to be gay or queer in STEM. And um, having myself come out as gay about 10 years ago at the age of 44, uh, we determined I was the oldest to come out among the <laughs> three of us. And uh, part of that for me, I mean, everybody's journey is different uh, and it's never too late is one of the things I like to say. Um, and, but uh, part of that is, is kind of the culture that one finds oneself in, as well as just who one is, who I was and who, what I was will, ready to accept. And I was in the STEM culture. I was sort of in, embedded into um, academic departments and doing science and all around me was a, a straight cis culture. And uh, that felt, um, felt like the thing to be uh, that reinforced maybe my own reluctance to sort of come to terms with who I am. And uh, so having this conversation is, is uh, personally rewarding for me as well that we, we get to do this in the school. And so thanks to you both. And uh, I will introduce uh, Lisa, whom nobody probably needs introduction to, but uh, just uh, uh, congratulate you, Lisa, on um, getting towards the 11th year or into the 11th year of a successful <laughs> uh, two terms of uh, building the college of the environment. And uh, thank you for all your work on that. And of course, uh, recognizing that you're a CFR slash CEPS alumna, uh, having spent time at Montana State and University of Arizona before coming back and um, doing all the great work you're doing here. And uh, on the other end of the career spectrum, I guess, is the um, uh, is Melissa Watkinson, who is a um, social scientist with Washington Sea Grant, uh, having completed a BA and MA uh, from UW Bothell. Um, and uh, so uh, with Washington Sea Grant also working in the ecology environment. And so this uh, sharing of your experience, and I look forward to sort of the different kinds of experiences that you've both had and, and, um, and uh, hearing more about the conversation. So thank you both for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. This is really exciting to get to have a re, re instead of a redo, a recharge of the conversation with Lisa um, about this topic and with our own, you know, closer to home community, which is really exciting. Um, we, we're going to start off with some introductions of ourselves going into more, a little bit more detail. Uh, and then, and then Lisa and I have kind of prepared a couple of questions to, um, to engage each other in conversation. And we really hope that, uh, those who are participating, um, in the webinar can also, uh, 
engage in the conversation. And, and right now that is by, you know, talking, maybe talking to each other, introducing yourselves in the chat. And if you have questions, putting that in the Q and A box. But we do have an, an option for you to provide anonymous questions uh, through a, a poll everywhere link, which we will share towards the end of our discussion. And so if, um, just keep track of your questions and uh, put them into that poll everywhere option if you if you'd like to go the anonymous route which is fine too uh, before we go in listen anything else i should cover no just dan thank you for inviting us to do this and and we're excited to do it so and thank you all for joining us oh Excellent. 30 some of you out there <laughs> so. great yeah, so uh, like Dan said, I'm Melissa Watkinson. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm a, Chicka a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, which is a tribe in Oklahoma. And I also descend from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. So these are two of the sister tribes who were forcibly removed um, from the uh, Southeast area to Oklahoma as part of Indian country. Uh, and um, my mom had lived in uh, was born in, and lived in Oklahoma up until the age of six, and, and my family started to move in, to the Northwest area. And uh, I have lived in Washington for most of my life. And my dad, who who raised my sister and I, uh, is a member of the Upper Skagit tribe. And so we have family who are enrolled um, there and I grew up culturally around the, around the Coast Salish um, community. And you know that's really been a part of um, my own experience and interest in uh, engaging uh, in the marine space with Washington Sea Grant um, and, and pursuing a career in uh, the environment in general. Generally, I uh, actually have a new job title with Sea Grant, the Equity, Access, and Community Engagement Lead, uh, where I'll be expanding some of the work that I do. Uh, to include more diversity, equity, and inclusion aspects. Um, yeah, that's about it for now, and I'm excited for more conversation with you, Lisa. Yeah, so Dan mentioned that I'm a College of Forest Resources, what the predecessor to Seth's alum. And just, I just need to say one plug about that. Um, in 1980, I wanted to study climate change as science and as impacts. And there was basically only one place in the whole country where you could do that, and that was the University of Washington. And there was really only one place within the University of Washington where you had the freedom to actually sit in that interface between science and thinking about what it meant for real people. And so I will always be really grateful to this institution for allowing me that and then for inviting me back as Dean. But that's a different story. What we're here to talk about is a little bit more about sort of identities. Um, unlike Deanne, I came out a little bit earlier, had a few more adventures, including when I was a PhD student here in the greater Seattle area. Um, and I am a Caucasian woman raised as a middle-class, um, person that had college educated parents, although the assumption was, despite the fact that I was good at math, was that I should learn how to type because I could probably become a secretary. So, you know, that was the a time and a place. Um, but instead, you know, have become a scientist and now am your dean. So, um, Melissa, you want to ask the first well, actually, let me say one more thing, which okay. is, um, it's weird being Dean. So, what? There's almost 2,000 students. There's 800 faculty, staff, research people. You know, there's, there's so many of you. And I feel lucky because, and because of my connection to SAFs, I've gotten to know um, a couple of you out there in the audience better. But one of the things I think we find when we have these intersecting identities is it gives us a chance to connect with people. And Melissa, I am really grateful that a couple of years ago, um, 
I was listening to some of the work that you were doing because it was of interest to me, particularly once again about the sort of science to sort of unpack for. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder if she's queer. And <laughs> and you know, it's not straightforward to like have that conversation when you're in a more powerful position and like mm -hmm. like how to do it. But like we sort of navigated through that and I've um I have really benefited from your generosity and the kinds of conversations and openness and um, and it's given me a feel for what it's like to be one of our senior professional staff people in this college and thank you thank you very much mm, yeah I really I really appreciated the um, relationship that we've been able to build um, as friends and professional colleagues and um, also just the mentorship that we get to share with one another um, Primarily, you know, be, because of, uh, you know, you, you're a, a really strong role model. You, you have uh, levels of diversity that um, you don't really see often. You know, you, you, have you are a representative of um, a larger community who is not represented uh, otherwise um, at this at your level within our work. And, uh, it's important to really um, have those representations to know that you know there's a place for folks who uh, you know women and um, uh, queer folks within uh, the, our work and so I really appreciate um, you stepping into that I, I think I remember one of our initial conversations <laughs> I don't know I don't know what drew you to believe that you know to, to think that um, or to question my my um, my queer identity, but I remember um, <laughs> one of the first times we met. I we had conversations just about fashion. I think there's just a sense of queer <laughs> fashion, like your shoes and scarf or something. And uh, and it was you know um, we met you know after you were after you had started your second term as dean, and so you started to talk about how you felt like oh it's just kind of you know the last run and you're really going to embrace this you know embrace who you are and you really don't have much to lose at this point so um you know i really admired that and know that you that means there's something behind all of that too right the history of yeah. of of not being able to of or a, a process of being able to get to that place for you um so yeah do, can you tell tell others or tell myself you know what was what was yeah. it like for you to come out and, and um, <laughs> especially in academia? So first of all, oh my God, I was never this comfortable. And I really can relate to what Dan was talking about, about the STEM culture. And it was so strong. So this is a true story. Um, I was an assistant professor at the University of Arizona and, you know, sort of a fine institution. And, um, I was there with my partner, a woman, and was um, being really careful, but not being particularly secretive, until one day, um, a very senior person, like a vice provost, a female vice provost, um, was starting to mentor me. You know, she started out, oh, like I'm an up and coming person, and she's gonna like help me. And, um, and somehow I mentioned my girlfriend to her, and, and she, um, she was very intrigued, but what she said to me was, oh, Lisa, you know, it's okay to be gay, just don't tell anybody. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and I'm an assistant professor without tenure, and she's a vice provost. And so I thought, okay, like, I'm just not going to tell anybody. And I just, you know, um, and, and to be honest, it, it it just felt like this real clamping down of my whole life and it, it gets worse. So, you know, she's, she's mentoring me and um, she nominated me for this really fancy fellowship. It was, the fellowship doesn't exist anymore. It was funded by the Kellogg Foundation and they would name like a hundred scholars from across all fields, you know, every year. And, and so I got nominated and then I had to write a bunch of essays and I got to the next level and then I had to write a bunch more essays. And I got to this level where um, they were going to interview about twice as many people as they were going to pick. And mm -hmm. so like I had like almost made it. I was like really excited. And I had to 
fly to Houston, Texas. They, the um, interviews were in a hotel and I was all ready. I want to talk about my vision. <laughs> it kind of sounds like the College of the Environment about sort of climate change and environmental change and bringing together interdisciplinary science and all the stuff you guys know about. And um, I had a really nice suit on. It was green silk. And um, I was all ready. And I walk in and it's going really well. You know, there's like four people sitting around a table and they're taking notes and they're kind of looking at me. and. And um, they get to the last question and they say, so Lisa, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? And, and actually, you know what? My heart starts to be just remembering this. And the first thing that pops into my mind, which of course was the right answer, was coming out. But I was like, all I could think about was like that vice provost that I can't tell anybody. And so I just froze. I was just like a complete deer in the headlights. And I could see them like putting down their pencil and kind of looking at the file for the next person and just realizing like, um, I'm not getting this fellowship. Mm. And it was because I was literally speechless. I mean, I could not speak. And then I said something really stupid, like, oh, getting like social scientists to talk to physical science. I mean, I, whatever. I don't know what I said. I said something. I got mm. out of there. And I was again, it's so vivid in my memory. I get in the, in the elevator to go up to my hotel room. And darn it, it was like one of those elevators that's like mirrors everywhere, like mirror, 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 like every place I turned, there was me, you know, like, ugh. And um, I just looked at myself, literally, like looked myself in the eyes and said, you are never doing that again. Like, whatever, you know, like, you are never gonna deny your identity. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped. And, um, and what was amazing, Melissa, was um, it really, it wasn't just that, like, my shoulders were no longer up around my ears. I mean, it's like um, my scientific creativity just went way up. And there was just a whole kind of unlocking of what happens when your whole self is comes to your role as scientist. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there weren't like scary moments and uncomfortable moments, but it was such a like you cannot you cannot do this you cannot you cannot hide anymore mm -hmm. so wow. that was what that was like yeah um, and i got tenure <laughs> <laughs> it, it, like it all turned out okay like like nothing terrible happened <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah but boy i was scared um, yeah it sounds like uh a, a really scary process and something um that you know we're and I, I i can only i can't speak for everybody because everyone's experience is different but it, you know um we, there's been progress in terms of being able to be um out in, in these spaces though you know we're here and in, in this conversation because it turns out you know that progress isn't a lot um yeah. you know and and uh and i think you're you know the conversation we're having conversation about coming out and being queer in STEM, which is its own own thing. And then there's there's like our lives, you know, um, outside of STEM, you know, which we're, there's also hurdles around. And and um, it's it's like you have to show up to do the work that you're passionate about. And when you're thinking about um, and have you know told, being told essentially to fear who you, who you are. Um, and be show up who you are in these places and both in and outside of work how do you have the mental capacity and the emotional capacity to show up and do the work well um so i think that's a you know compelling story so melissa what was it like for you <sighs> yeah so uh before we started we were kind of talking about when the moments we were coming out down said 10 years ago at 44 and it just made me think about my own experience. I am 32 and I came out uh, at the age of 29 and I, which was, you know, just over three years ago, I suppose. And at the time when I started, you know, when you're kind of coming out, um, you, I was just trying to like be in more queer spaces and in Seattle, there's quite a few. So um, you know, social media can like offer these get-togethers and whatnot. 
And I remember going to one of them and overhearing this other conversation with a couple of uh, queer women who were saying like, yeah, like how we how weird is it for people to not be out these days? Like, come on, it's like whatever it was, 2018 or so, 2017. I was just like, oh no, like I just came out like last month, you know. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I I think I think uh, it was really made me, that made me reflect on it because everyone's experience is really different. And Dan was speaking about, uh, you know, I think the pressure of STEM culture having an influence on on that. And for me, um, it wasn't particularly STEM culture. I think it, I think it generally it could have been academia, but um, you know, I, I, I kind of grew up with this uh, pressure to kind of be a um, good wife and, you know, not necessarily pursue um, these big things while still, you know, being supported by my parents for, for doing, for accomplishing things, but I felt like this, um, I think because I had oppressed my own identity for so long, I started to believe these, these things. And so I had been uh, out as bi with several of my friends for um, several years uh, and in relationships with men, um, but didn't really feel like I could embrace that part of who I was um, because to the pressures of society, I just felt like the people who were kind of being themselves were um, were being harmed in a lot of ways. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it's, it's a part of, uh, I, I got, I worked with the Dorsey Conservation Scholars Program, which is a program within the College of Environment um, between graduate school and getting um, my position now at Sea Grant. And I, that program works with a lot of young people and it was kind of engaged working with them and seeing how they kind of just embrace their full identities and yeah, yeah. show up as who they are that really encouraged me and so that was that summer actually that I you know after I returned from from um, working with those students that I came home and um, ended my long-term relationship and came out to my family and um, really felt empowered to um, you know embrace my whole self uh and uh and i and i again same like i can't ever go back to that not being who i am um anymore uh, mm -hmm. and you know yeah. uh that is includes identifying you know where i have privilege and where where i don't and loving all of and embracing all of it um yeah so they're yeah, definitely love, different experience. Um, I love the part of the story that's about you sort of navigating um, the the courage and at times also the the impatience of um, a sort of generation of people that grew up with um, you know marriage equality as sort of a given and you know when i think about what has changed over my time you know whether it's in academia or not is this real huge shift generationally in um people exploring their gender identity their sexual orientation um mm. all of our sort of gender queer you know, sort of community, um, non-binary, transgender, and I feel like it's such a gift. And some of you are on this call. I'm looking at all of you um, <laughs> with huge gratitude, uh, because it it feels like it gives all of us this space to explore and imagine, and and not you know not just sort of be boxed in by societal expectations and i keep i even think like you know if you're like a cis straight person it's still like there's more oxygen in the room now you know like mm. like yeah you're a cis straight person but there's like you know there's all this this other ways that um we're sort of coming to to understand ourselves and it's boy it's um it's such a gift it's such a gift that um and it's a gift that I feel like all of those 
communities are giving not just to each other, but to all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're talking about some of the observations that you've kind of seen over time and um, particularly with, with gender. And, uh, and then again, you know, I, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a, a tiny bit just because, um, well, I'm looking at time, but also just reflecting <laughs> on like <laughs> what's happening now. And, and I think, uh, I think when we kind of start drafting some of these questions, or even if, you know, that was a week ago and things have changed and, um, my my own fear for those rights to sustain be sustained is is in place right now and and how do i you know talk to some family members about you know why this is this is a fear of of mine and, and folks in our community you know the specifically marriage equality and um and trans rights and you know um you know, those are real hardships that uh, a lot of, um, you know, members in the LGBTQ community are, are facing right now and, and as well as other, other basic rights that, you know, are, are potentially on the line for um, other, other communities, um, minority communities and communities of color. And um, it's just really hard to not have that kind of be at the forefront right now. Um, yeah. And to, and to continue, the, you know, the reality is we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the midst of the rest of society kind of starting to become aware or have an interest in understand, better understanding um, oppression, you know, and, and racism. And we're also in this kind of political sense in society um, of, division, you know, and, um, and so it's, it's all, all, all so many different layers where, you know, I think we can talk about, you know, the, the progression that the progress that's happened over time, but um, it's really hard to look past this moment for me personally, honestly, um, it's scary. And how, how do we, you know, not, instead of making, um, showing up to in, in the academy and, and working in STEM, a thing that feels like a hardship or a place that you have to armor yourself, how do we make it a place where we can kind of show up and, and let that go, right? Like, how can we feel like yeah. we can embrace yeah. each other and, uh, and really start to feel like this is a place where you fully belong, where you should feel safe, where you should be able to um, be supported in the path that you want to have here you know um so those are some of my thoughts and in terms of kind of the more recent observation questions that we we're going to reflect on and um that i don't know if at least if you wanted to say anything more about um those kinds of experiences right now well it was funny because i was actually trying to sort of go back to get you to um go a little further about the intersectionality Mm -hmm. issue so like when you talk about sort of showing up at work in a, in a place of safety you know that it's not um just about being queer in stem it's about all the identities mm -hmm. that we bring and many of which feel you know potentially th you know a threat right now but um do you do you want to say a little bit more about what that's like for you in terms of the multiple identities you kind of touched on it. Yeah, yeah. I, so you know, I I am identify as a queer Indigenous woman, and I also you know I have I often in many spaces pass as white. I can also you know depending on like which way I put my hair, pass as you know, not queer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and then at the same time like i can i can also um show up in those communities and be accepted uh for who i am in those identities and and but these aren't you know two different things of who i am these are these are all combined this makes it this is the inter these are the intersections of who i am and, and where i come from and so um i think um 
I think I, in, in stating that and acknowledging it as a way for me to kind of provide and maybe offer some representation of that um, in this space and in STEM, while also not like wanting to say that, uh, I guess, in this moment, I feel like I have needs, right? Like I have things that I need, I need, I have my buckets a little empty and I'm needing some support for that. Um, but there are times when um, others, you know, the who have uh, brown skin, dark brown, black skin, um, trans folks, you know, those who have um, experiences that uh, have historically had um, more difficult experiences of oppression, you know, often need um, that allyship a little bit more. And so, so uh, I don't know, I guess that's just a call to maybe, maybe say like, um, how do we, let's look, take an opportunity to really reflect on who we are um, and, uh, and both in those, you know, what, what gives us an opportunity to really feel power and privilege in some spaces and what, where are opportunities you know, and how do we use that to support other people and more opportunities where, where we might um, need, be needing more of that um, support for filling that bucket. Um, and so Lisa, if it's okay, um, I can offer an opportunity to engage the audience. Okay, I would great. love that because, you know, I mean, this is kind of fun, but oh my gosh, I can't, you know, we can't see, we don't even get to see you. Like, who are you out there? Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you really just like, Doing this and cooking dinner. Oops, my computer. Uh, well, maybe they're cooking dinner. I know I like to make art sometimes while I'm listening to some presentations. I've been known to do a yoga pose or two. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, so I am sending this. Um, I am sending a link to a program called the Poll Everywhere. So you should be able to just click that link, um, and it will take you to our poll. It may ask you. Um, to put your name, don't worry about doing that. These are all going to be anonymous. Um, kind of like, you know, skip through some of those initial processes. And there will be an initial question on there uh, we're asking you to engage in. So what are some of your social identities, maybe in one to two words, and you can, you can um, respond more than once, that are influenced either positively and or negatively by power and privilege? We're starting to see some results come in. So you see the results, but I don't see the results. Oh, you don't okay. get to see the results. Can I share? No, you're the oh. you're the keeper of results. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, a, that's a power. That is. That's a power and a privilege. <laughs> uh, let me let me try to share my screen here. Um, There we go. Let's see. Now you think you you can see here we've got um, white and woman are clearly the the most mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the identities that most of the folks on this webinar are, uh, identify with. Um, We've got some uh, sexuality and gender identities that are listed here, talking about class, uh, heritage. Um, great, I see we're moving a lot. Um, race, tall. <laughs> Mixed. Uh, Mix, which is always so interesting because then that creates all sorts of challenges and opportunities. Yeah, um, this is really great. Um, okay, so you can go ahead and keep, um, if you want to go ahead and keep adding there, um, we're gonna go and move on. But we are gonna be using this tool a couple more times uh, throughout our um conversation so just you can keep that screen that uh tab open on your laptop yeah that was kind of a warm-up <laughs> <laughs> um, okay 
Okay, all right, great. Uh, yeah, so, you know, one of the things, Lisa, that um, I have really enjoyed hearing you speak about and also has made me really kind of process and think through, like, how do I, how does this relate to my life in different places is the idea of, like, of queer superpowers, right? Um, so, you, you know, you've talked about your superpower and uh, would you, can you kind of give another <laughs> overview of what that that means for you? I would love to. And some of this is, um, particularly for my generation, being gay or queer was just had all of these layers of like sadness and tragedy. And, and um, particularly once I came out, it, it felt like fun. And, you know, I mean, like, a, where was all the sadness and tragedy? But then mm -hmm. I also started to realize there were, um, there were things that I knew or skills I had developed as a queer person that were really useful, not just in navigating my queer identity, but in life in general. So one of the things, and um, every person sort of on this call that has a more complicated identity, you knows this feeling, you walk in a room and you like are looking around and kind of assessing your safety. And there is a social consciousness about who's in the room, what kind of, I mean, this sounds like, you know, what kind of energy do they have? Like what, you know, kind of what's going on? And, 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 and so you get, um, I think you develop some, some sensitivity about that and, and that's a good thing it also can be burdensome like it's really nice to like walk in a room and just kind of like feel accepted and not have all these like, antennas <laughs> on. but um i think intellectually what it did for me was um it made it really easy to span boundaries because it meant that um it, it, things never felt quite as black and white and this space between intellectual traditions or disciplines to be honest felt really comfortable to me it was a it, it was a place that was um sometimes contested and sometimes difficult and i was used to that i was in a contested sexual identity so like yeah you know there's tension around you know sort of these different sort of sub disciplines and and, and found that i you know, I could navigate that really well, which turned out to be like really useful, you know, in terms of papers and grant proposals and campaign and, um, and all that kind of thing. But so it, it felt like um, not having, being a kind of insider outsider all the time really felt like a superpower. And, um, and I felt really grateful, you know, the, mm. that, that I actually had a life that allowed me mm -hmm. to have that superpower. Mm -hmm. And um, Melissa knows, I'm like really serious. It's really like a superpower. And <laughs> way out there, like, you gotta like figure out what your superpowers are, because heck, you're gonna need them. Um, uh -huh. You need a cake. Melissa, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Melissa, how do you relate to the superpower thing? You know, I uh, can resonate a lot with how you're describing your superpower. And I just, you know, think that uh, I add a layer to that. My experience adds a layer as a as a native um, person adds a layer to that, um, because I have like you know this these privileges to be in in these spaces where I'm kind of like my skin tone path is more comfortable for um, the predominantly white environmental field, right? So I'm able to mm -hmm. kind of be in these spaces, but my communities, uh, you know, are, the folks who I identify most within my community are, are people of color and other um, Native folks uh, and other queer folks. And so it's at, both within this kind of learning, uh, you know, I guess more recently stepping into um, who I am as a, as a lesbian, as a gay woman, queer woman, um, you know, being able to acknowledge that that kind of code switching um, oh, ability yeah, yeah. is certainly a superpower in that, um, 
but it also stems from my own kind of um, identity as an indigenous woman um, being, you know, um, being mixed race, passing, um, uh, you know, in different ways within different, within different groups and um, switching, you know, switching that code while also being able to um, translate. You know, I think, I think a lot of that, I have the privilege and, and um, to also some, yeah, you're talking about kind of like the insider outsider and I was recently having conversations around like the inside and the outside strategies, right? Um, and so there's, there's these concepts where you have, um, you know, we have our own lived experiences and then we have our, our experiences that are, where we have kind of, we show up with our, um, uh, in, in our professional worlds. Um, and we also have experiences where like, we have these passions and efforts that we really want to change, you know, our vision for the world. And so how do we utilize these different strengths and superpowers that we have, um, to make that come, you know, make that happen. Um, and so I, I just love the idea and then you know, continuing to embrace the idea of, of these superpowers um, because it's so encouraging, you know, in a lot of ways to feel that our, you know, identity as queer people is a huge strength um, in our work especially. And how do we, uh, you know, how do we support our um, queer siblings to, you know, um, also feel that strength and energy and how do we, you know, um, you know, embrace it enough that we can also can, you know, we have to, where we have to stop convincing our, the rest of our colleagues that this, yeah. these are our strengths, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we wanted to uh, ask folks as well who are participating, do you have a superpower and what are your superpowers? So I'm going to go ahead and um, open up a different question. Uh, I can repost that link in, uh, in the chat, though it's the same one. So if you go to that same Poll Everywhere link, you should be able to see a question that says, what is your superpower? So if you... And this is anonymous. And this is anonymous. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the one of the things we were talking about as we were getting ready for this is that um, sometimes, particularly when we're have the ability to be kind of anonymous, I was talking about like ways we often sort of go to the edges of some of our aspirational identities when we're back in the days when we sit on planes and talk to strangers. Like, this is your chance to like. It can be like a true superpower. It could be like the superpower <laughs> that you're you're like you're getting in. So, Melissa, are we getting some superpowers? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> oh good. We're getting, some, I can't we're getting some superpowers. My superpower is not Zoom etiquette. <laughs> That's fine. So let me uh, let me go back and scroll a little bit. Oh my gosh. Um, boundaries banning, humor, music, great listening, social chameleon. Ooh. Um, social patience. chameleon yeah yeah using my privilege as a queer person of my understanding of being alone and often undesired or hated in the world to make change for others uh, who is much less who in much less privileged identities are in intersectionalities than me yeah thank I mean, you yeah thank you thank you for sharing polished to rough look <laughs> I think in right. the environmental field, that's like important. That's like yeah. really important. You gotta do both. Um, Empathy, uh, listening, love of dogs, yes. My dogs really wish, you know, wanna be in this room right now with me. Uh, freedom from conformity. Mm -hmm. Passionate, passionate, strong feeler, connecting dreamer. Okay, these are excellent. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, just to... yeah, and hold on to that because these are like, you know, as your mentors and faculty, so we don't tell you to put your superpowers on your CV or 
you know, go to a <laughs> seminar to enhance your superpower. You're going to need all of those, you know, like hang on to those. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And they, I mean, they really transcend um, all aspects, you know, of who we are. So, uh, you know, I think, I think when you talk about kind of um, expanding these boundaries, like that's probably not just something that happens in the workplace, right? That's probably mm -hmm. um, something that happens when you're supporting uh, your, your daughters, you know, in whatever ways, or you're, um, you know, working in other personal areas of your life. <clears throat> I know that for me, um, you know, that code switching is, is a superpower that I carry um, in, in a lot of areas of my life as well, outside of work. So definitely, I think it's, you know, a part of who we are, um, for sure. So uh, I wanted to, I, maybe if you're in the same Pull Everywhere screen, you've already seen me kind of transition to this next question um, or this next opportunity. So this is an opportunity, you know, we're wanting to start to get to you to share any questions you might have for us. Uh, we have the anonymous um, Pull Everywhere option where you can submit questions there. Um, and, you know, these are uh, coming, these aren't, these are completely anonymous, but we want so we wanted to provide that option if you feel um, like you're more comfortable or familiar with using the Q&A option in the Zoom, you can use that as well. Um, but now is a really great time to start asking those questions before we wrap up our own. And I'm watching the chat, Melissa, if you can watch the poll everywhere. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, you know, oh, let me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One second. Sorry about that. There's some. There's uh, some moderating at tools that were set up on here, and uh, also just not letting me see what the questions are. Because um, I see that folks have responded a few, and I'm not seeing the responses show up. So. Um, okay. So can you talk about the explicit ways you use your privilege to make a change in your field? Oh, wow, that's, that's an incredibly important question. Um, do you wanna try and tackle this question first? Yeah. Um, first of all, I wanna just start with a caveat that there's always more to do. Um, so as, as dean, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of sort of privilege and and power, and um, have sought to develop sort of initiatives and ways in which we create culture and policies in the College of the Environment that are better for everyone. There's still a long ways to go, but when I um, when I think um, for, for example, and some of it was behavior as well as um, a lot of something that I feel like really oppresses all of our identities is a sort of workaholic culture. And so, yeah, frankly, because when I started seeing, I still had two kids at home. And when meetings would like, supposed to end at five and they weren't ending, I just walk out of the room. <laughs> and um, it's like, no, you know, we said we're gonna end at five. You know, people have lives to live. Mm. And um, I'm not gonna send you emails on Saturdays. And I'm, you know, I'm going to demonstrate 
work-life balance to the degree that any of us ever gets sort of very good at that. Um, and which is something that's kind of good for everyone. Um, I feel like there's been times and places where individuals, and once again, this gets into places where for all sorts of HR reasons, we can't talk about, um, we were able to respond to and champion situations where people were unfairly treated and we could seek redress. And it was something that um, I just, I couldn't, I could not do it. You, know, you can't not, when I couldn't not see it, you know, I couldn't not do it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, um, I have a, a, an example related to gender identity and, you know, uh, we have um, at Washington Sea Grant, we've made it a practice to incorporate our pronouns into our email signatures. Uh, and then we also offer a resource for people to kind of one, you know, who might ask us what this is. Um, to be able to look more into what that means, um, what are pronoun what pronouns mean, and or and or why we put them in our email signatures. We also start them with. Uh, we also start each of our meetings with um, resetting our pronouns, and you know there are some sometimes where um, folks may still be misgendered, and uh, the, it's really challenging, you know. Um, to kind of confront those folks who you work really closely with um, multiple times on, um, you know, uh, uh, something that you want to be an ally in or, you know, help to make a, make a, a change. Um, but I think it's important to continue, you know, to open up that dialogue and, and to kind of just acknowledge that some changes can be hard, you know. Um, you know, we, we all make mistakes, especially early on when um, becoming more familiar with using different pronouns. Um, and it's, it's important uh, also that we don't misgender folks, you know, we, it really, I think, puts a huge damper on people's um, ability to show up and their experience and to feel seen and valued in a space if, if, they, if somebody is constantly misgendered. And it's you know, so there. It's important you know, just to be able to call people by who who they are, you know. Um, and so that's one explicit way that we've we've really tried to model um, the recognition of gender diversity within Washington Sea Grant. And uh, um, I think other explicit ways that we're working on um, using. I guess privilege as an organization, right? Because we're we have um, we're in, we're improving on increasing our representation and diversity within our organization, though it's still a predominantly white organization. Uh, and so, um, using privilege in ways to kind of be a model and um, and and leading by example on. You know, how is it that we're developing our, uh, you know, our board and our advisory committee? Um, you know, how is it that we're transforming our hiring processes? And what is it that we're doing in terms of offering educational experiences? And so these are all areas of our, of our work at Washington Sea Ground where we've really taken a hard look and, and made a lot of big changes and are sharing that, that with those experiences and lessons with others, um, which I think has been a really important way to um, make a change, you know, across the field more broadly. We have one in the chat. Yeah. Um, for those of us who teach, this is a question, not bringing your authentic self to the classroom can really hold you back from connecting to your students. What have your experiences been? So, and this is from Erica. Um, I absolutely agree that that is a challenge. And um, the degree to which 
and and sort of feel like I was always walking that line about connecting to students and bringing my whole self to the classroom. And it, um, I would find ways of, you know, like anything else, sort of stepping your toe in the water, um, and just throwing. I mean, just with respect to. Um, not just sort of bringing my whole self to the classroom, but bringing multiple identities of other scholars and resources into the classroom to sort of make space for this kind of, um, you know, sort of cloud of mentors and, you know, figures that, that can be sort of inspirational to people. So I think it's, um, I think it's both how you present yourself and that, giving without having shedding too much of a light on yourself so it's sort of all about yourself but um sort of revealing some sort of experiences and and things about your life that that make you a real person and being willing to emotionally react is is part of i think being a good faculty member but i also think um connecting students you know you you are setting a culture about who has knowledge and who has expertise besides you? I mean, you, you know, your, your embodied bit, but who's on your syllabus and who comes in as your um, sort of guest speakers, et cetera, is a way in which we can so vastly increase the rich diversity of of who who has expertise and. And what are the sources of knowledge and, and what is it that we are trying to integrate? So Erica, I'm kind of like raising you on, it's like not just bringing yourself in, but like bringing everybody sort of in with you. Um, but you know, a piece for that, oh man, I can remember being told this and I just so didn't want to believe it. But you know, you, you design that syllabus and there's like, there's 10 weeks and there are like the 10 incredibly important concepts like that everybody needs to know and you've got to make sure they all get in. And then when you start messing with all of this, how do I sort of enrich maybe one or two critical concepts like don't end up in the syllabus. And um, I think remembering that as faculty members, we are both delivering content, but we are delivering how to think about thinking and how to engage with the world and how to be curious and how to be a ethical human being. And there's so much that we are teaching besides, <laughs> I'd like to joke about the Krebs cycle because I swear I never actually really learned it. And the name Krebs cycle, like whatever. Your Dean doesn't really remember the Krebs cycle. It's okay. So, um, and that's what, that's what I think about. So, oh my gosh, Dan is on and it's... It's time. Is it time? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It must come to an end. <laughs> uh, can I close with one question that Lisa and I kind of discuss often? Sure. Um, what are you currently reading, Lisa? I love about being at home. I um, I picked up a book by Kelly Brown Douglas. It's called Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. And it's weaving through how it is that theology and social practice conspire to allow white culture to think of black bodies as, as property and all of the implications of that. And it goes deep through time and, and it's, it's dense and it challenges my thinking a lot. Mm. Lisa, what's on your right. bedstand? So I have a Kindle, so there's several there. Though one of my, the one I just ended up closing with last night was called Fairest. And it's about this, uh, albino Filip Filipina trans woman who grew up in the Philippines and then whose family moved to California and she eventually uh, went to school at Harvard and uh, that's when she came out um, first as gay and then transitioned um, as a woman and just the 
the way that she is able to tell her experience about, um, you know, the intersectionality of her identities, both, you know, be, kind of being um, Philip, from the Philippines, uh, uh, but passing as a white American, you know, in, in a lot of ways when she moves to America, uh, and then that transition of, you know, um, identifying as a man and then a woman. Wow, it was just so um, humbling and, and also just kind of warming too. So um, yeah, thanks for letting us close with that. It's nice to be able to share what we're learning and thinking about these days. Well, thank you yeah. both for, um, you didn't disappoint on the sort of intimate conversation and letting us in look, um, look into your experiences and lives and, and how it reflects back on uh, how we think about ourselves. It's, it's a, and, our, and the work that we do, it's, uh, it's a different kind of a seminar than we're typically used to, but I think it, <laughs> it's valuable in this time and in this uh, environment to really um, see these kind of more intimate mm -hmm. people that we work with, not just the uh, data and the, and the projects. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jan. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for your leadership. Thank you, Lisa. It was great talking with you again. Yeah, Melissa, if only we could be taking a walk. Yeah. Someday. Soon. <laughs> okay, see you all. Okay. See you next, Goodbye, next colleagues.